It's the Kyle Hyman Show on Redeemer Radio. I think what we need to be focusing on is the fact that this is one of the only depictions of the crucifixion in which we don't see Christ at all. I mean, look at Mary's face. You know, it makes me want to cry. You can't talk about art history without seeing the impact Catholicism has had on art and the impact that art has had on Catholicism. It's time for our monthly art history lesson with Charles and Amanda Shepard from the Fort Wayne Museum of Art. Welcome to our Catholic art history lesson. I'm Kyle Hyman here with Charles and Amanda Shepard at the Fort Wayne Museum of Art. Thank you again for having me at your beautiful establishment. (laughs) Oh, thanks for having us on your program. My pleasure, Kyle. What are we learning about today? Well, we're talking about an artist that... We probably, nobody knows him, but he was actually the most famous and decorated French artist of his time. Really? Yeah. He ended up winning something called the Legion of Honor, a a French award for his achievements in art. And his given name, his French name is Jacques Joseph Tissot, but he was obsessed with English culture. So he anglicized his name and became James Tussaud. Okay. So we're talking about the mid 19th century here. So he's born in 1836 and then he lived until 1902. So his, his big years of working were the 1850s to about the 1890s. Okay. I feel like the opposite would happen today. An American artist would maybe try to make their name more French, (laughs) sound more artistic. (laughs) I don't know if, if maybe he thought the English were more dignified, more noble and, French, more provincial. I don't know. I'm yeah. just shooting in the dark, but uh-huh. I, I guess he he didn't want to be Jacques. He wanted to be James. But professionally, people would find him as James Trousseau. Yes. Okay. Yes. Tissot. Yeah. Not- Tissot. Tissot. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So he would have been known. Well, let's let's back up with his biography. His mom was a pious Catholic. His dad, I don't think as much. His mom really supported his artistry. His dad was a luxury fabric merchant. So the family was really kind of part of the French fashion world at the time. And that will become more meaningful as we talk about his work. Right around the 1860s, he was able to find a lot of success painting society portraits. So fashionable women dressed in really beautiful clothing. He is not only making a lot of money doing this, but he also kind of has a card up his sleeve that I've been around this beautiful fabric all my life. I can paint it really well. And when you look at some of these society portraits, you'll notice there's just the way he's done the drapery and the skill is unmatched by other artists. Well, and it's important to note at this juncture that he was friends with Degas, Manet, all the hip artists of the time hmm. who were, were very well liked, but not as successful as he. I mean, he was so successful that in his second or third year on, on his own, he was making 94,000 francs a year. I, I don't know the equivalent of dollar terms, but you know the, the top people in the country with companies in their name were, were making ninety four to 100000 a year. So he was really well liked, but that uh, disgusted Degas, Manet, and all the, all the cutting edge artists who had had him as a friend before because they think he was selling out. Hmm. Well, so how do they become popular names in art and he not? If he's more popular at the time, how does Monet become more famous today? Well, because Monet or Degas or Renoir, they went longer without to make a bigger breakthrough in a very art world serious way. Whereas the serious art world looks at Tissot and says, oh, the the guy's a society guy. He's a one-trick pony. He knows how to do these wonderful, idealized portraits of of women and people in society. But he he turned down a chance to be an impressionist show because he thought they were all kind of crude. So the art community thinks he sells out and yep. then that that selling out, whatever it was, ultimately leads to him not being as popular over time. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Let me let me come at it from a different perspective. Uh-huh. So today we think of Monet, Degas, and Manet as 
great impressionists and titans of the art world, and we really put them on pedestals as the greats, and that's when art was really good. Uh But you have to remember at the time, they were the renegades, they were the rebels, because impressionism was a rebellious art form. Because at the time, a lot of painters thought that academic or realistic looking painting was a lie. It was trying to be reality, but it's not reality. And so if we artists can never fully capture reality, why don't we paint something that's more about the spiritual realm? A lot of artists at the time were worried about, okay, so this is, this is modernism starting to develop. We contemporary people think that modern art is anything that's unrecognizable and maybe even ugly. Uh-huh. But these are actually the early modernists because... Not they, to so, but the other ones. I mean, he's a modernist in the sense that he painted at that time. Okay. And he painted modern society and he reflected the ideas of the time. Okay. Okay, so we today think that impressionism is so harmless and wonderful and calming and relaxing. But uh, can you stop for a second? What is impressionism? Take the haystacks. It's the easiest one to, for everybody to get in their mind. Monet has a studio. It joins a farm. And the farmer's out there, and he's got his haystacks. And it was a, a big deal to Monet to paint outdoors, paint, mm-hmm. paint life in the elements, paint uh-huh. whatever's out there. So he asked the farmer, can I paint these haystacks? So he's, gets up and he goes out as soon as the sun's up and he starts painting a haystack. He, you know, he takes a break, gets some coffee, comes back. Well, the lights changed. So the haystack, which looked greenish yellowy uh, when he started, now looks brilliantly gold with orange tinges because the sun's changed on uh-huh. a haystack and the moisture changed. And so the, the first day he does this, he comes back and tells somebody that this is very elusive, you know. <laughs> this thing changes all day long for me. Uh-huh. And then, it, then it dawns on him, yeah. That's exactly right. Things change in light, and that's what we're going to give you is the impression of what it looks like at this moment. So if you compare to our guy Tussaud, Tussaud is staying with the old way of doing these idealist, perfect figures that he actually is going to finish in the studio. Monet's out there getting wet, painting haystacks that keep changing color, Uh and he's on to a bigger discovery than to sew, but it it launches the whole Impressionist movement as everybody gets the notion that things are not the same every minute. Right. And they don't exist in your mind, they exist in real life. So get outdoors and paint plein air, go paint lily pads. I mean, these are subjects that aren't even, or weren't even good subjects, they're just (laughs) paint haystacks? Yeah. There's not a lot of people out there to buy haystack paint. (laughs) Right. You know, today there is, but so Tussaud is thinking, mm, I don't think those haystacks are going to sell, man. I am doing society people. Uh-huh. So to the Impressionists, it was more important to convey an emotion, to convey a feeling, to convey, as Charles said, the impression that you get, not necessarily a pictorial replication of reality, because the painters felt that that was a zero sum game. We're never going to get to it. Um, to fully capture reality is beyond who we are. And so why why don't I paint the feeling that you get when you look at the haystack? And I'm going to focus on colors. I'm going to focus on loose brush strokes and a lot of gesturing and Mm -hmm. a lot of feeling. So as Charles said, at the time, those guys were the rebels. Tussaud was uh, more mainstream and making a lot more money. And then Monet and Manet and Degas, though they were doing well, they weren't exactly the most popular. But over time, because they've been entrenched in art history, they gain their fame as the years go on. Okay. So they they invent something new, which is why art history remembers them. Right. And to so... He doesn't go backwards. He just doesn't come forward very quickly. Gotcha. And in 1874, Degas did invite him to be part of the Impressionist. So oh. I, I guess, you know, over the course of modern art history, you'll see these different groups of artists kind of band together and say, we're the Impressionists, we're the Surrealists, we're the Symbolists. And they might have a manifesto. They might have 
a code that they have to follow or subjects that they can do and styles that they have to stay within. And, and they're going to be, you know, carrying the torch for that style. Well, Tissot said, no, thanks. I don't want to be part of the Impressionists. So that was in 1874. In 1875, he met a woman, fell in love. She was a divorcee and they were both trying to become more devout Catholics. Mm -hmm. But their situations prevented them from marrying in the right way or what they what wanted to do in, within the church. Okay. When you read his story, I'm thinking, you know, she's his model and he likes her. Okay. And he likes her as a model, but he finds he likes her as a, as a person and he, then he loves her. Uh -huh. And she moves in with him. And I'm thinking, this Catholic, why didn't he ask her to marry him? Uh -huh. But she has a has had a child out of wedlock, uh -huh. and in devout terms, he's skipping a step. He's thinking, "Oh no, we can't even approach the church because they're not going to approve this. She's already done wrong. I'm doing wrong now. We're just wrong." So they rather than go. <laughs> my first thought is that find a priest, right? Discuss this. He'll show you the way out. They just conclude that they're not going to be welcomed, which may have been the case at the time. I think our church has gone a long way into recognizing how to be more charitable. Yeah. Well, <laughs> you know, show and, people and that there are steps the that you can take right. to get closer to where you know that you should be yeah. at the very least. Yeah, you're right. I just thought of that. You know, who knows the, what the climate would have been like at the time. Well, and he and she, aside from that, lived perfectly well uh, other than that. And they, okay. were, they were devout even though they weren't as devout as they needed to be to get together. And when she died of basically a plague, he was devastated. That, hmm. that was the most pinnacle moment of his life to meeting her and raising her child. And they had a child and that it was cr crushed in, in a plague was just devastating. And then he goes back to religion. So he, hmm. around 1885, he reverted to his Catholic faith and spent the rest of his this is after she died, spent the rest of his career painting biblical scenes. And actually, a, as many Old Testament scenes as there were New Testament scenes. And what we're going to talk about today is an illustration from one of 365 illustrations of the life of Christ. And hmm. all of them were purchased by the Brooklyn Museum in 1900. And before that time, they'd been shown all over the world, really well received, really popular. And as we can see, not impressionistic at all, not abstract at all. He's he's adhering to basically a depiction of reality. So 365 paintings, was this a daily thing? <laughs> or is this I, just a coincidence that possibly, it happens to be the number of days I don't know. Okay. Well, he, he painted with a material known as gouache. It's a fun word to say. It's uh -huh. G-O-U-A-C-H-E. And it's basically like a chalky, opaque watercolor. So you have some flexibility with it. It dries really quickly. It has a little bit of a transparency, luminosity to it. You can make fairly quick paintings with gouache, even though, I mean, this looks like it. Just the level of illustration is, is pretty intricate. So I'll describe it for our listeners. It's called What Our Lord Saw from the Cross. It's a view of the crucifixion from the perspective of Christ himself and the only part of his body that we see are his feet. So he's looking down and in the foreground, right at his feet is Mary Magdalene. And that's signified by the long, long red hair flowing hmm. out from under her veil. And then right behind her is Mary, his mother. She's clutching her heart and looking right into his eyes. And then John the Evangelist to her right. And then those are the only figures that are kind of in this stony, empty walking area. And then surrounding them in half circles going off into the horizon are the Jewish priests, the Roman soldiers, townspeople, all staring at Christ. And I remember when we talked about him being from a fashion family and his dad being a tapestry merchant, what I noticed first is that everybody is draped in four or five different mm, right. <laughs> robes of beautiful colors. And he's... Even the horse. I mean, yeah, the, yeah, everything is covered in 
a fashionable costume. And even when he's omitted facial details of the figures in the background, he's made sure that the robes have dimension and a texture to them. At the same time, <laughs> this is very different than his earlier work, the, the secular model. When you talked about those flowing fabrics, the detail mm -hmm. of the patterns on a dress or something like that, as you mentioned, was I, I, I've never seen anything like that well, outside and, of a photo. And it, it's even almost better than a photo. In truth. And this is much more rudimentary. Yes. Well, and it's because he makes a big stylistic shift, both a head and heart driven shift. He moves away from the idealism that caused his original success. It brought uh -huh. about his original success, but also brought about the other more modern artists not caring for what he did. Uh -huh. He moves away from that to realism. And it, in reality, not everybody is as beautiful, as handsome as he used to paint them. Yeah. <laughs> and he always drapes everybody, sure. but all their clothes aren't equal. You know, mm. here when we see the priests, they're, they're pretty fancily decked out. Mm -hmm. The Roman soldier's pretty fancily decked out. A lot of other people, there are patterns and there are lots of drapes and waves, but it, they're much more modest, much more roughshod, and and his as you say his whole style becomes, uh, in a sense, you're tempted to say it's a more primitive style. Right. It, it's really his way of getting us to reality, and a signal that he's giving up on the idealistic way he's been trained in the academies. Is it also just a different in medium that using this gouache or the watercolor is just not as detailed of an I think art? He, I think he could have been equally detailed, but I. You know, I, I may be going too far, but I, but I almost think her death and his wife. Yes, I'm or sorry, her, his wife, his companion. Whatever, death, whatever yes, her situation yes. was. I I think it's it's putting back on a spiritual track, and I think he's feeling bad about his deceiving idealistic perspective, which brought him all the money. Hmm. You know, now he's now he's learned that the money didn't mean anything. It, it, it didn't mean that they stayed together. It, it didn't mean that she lived. So. Well, he was still very successful this time. As we know, the Brooklyn Museum purchased all of them. You know, we don't know what the stylistic shift was all due to, but I still think we need to pay attention to the fact that he hasn't joined the Impressionists. Mm -hmm. And what this was in the late 19th century. And we're not getting any closer to going back to a realistic style in art history. That it's we're not. It's not like oh, the impressionists were a blip on the radar, and now guys like Tussaud could go back to what they really like to do. You so, mean modern day? Today we're not. No, going I'm back saying to, like in or the, this time in the trajectory <laughs> of modern art and all the isms. You know, if you want to talk about it as like a, a devolution, we're devolving from realism and academic painting to almost in the 1950s where we're only painting black canvases and we're calling, we're saying painting is dead. Uh -huh. What I'm saying is, is he's not going along with that trend and he's, he's sticking with a realistic style. And think about how many of these he painted, 365 of them. Like you said, Kyle, like you, you can't labor over these for three or four months, right. like you would an oil painting. <laughs> and the scale of it was probably not anywhere near those society portraits think of the wealthy people commissioning a huge society portrait of themselves to put in one of their huge homes. Uh -huh. <laughs> you want it to be big. <laughs> this is probably much more intimate in scale. It's, it's more difficult to achieve the level of detail. And like I said, gouache is, you know, anything water-based is going to slip around on your paper. It's, yeah. it's going to be more difficult to control. I think what we need to be focusing on is the fact that this is one of the only depictions of the crucifixion in which we don't see Christ at all. Yeah. He's looking down on the, and I mean, look at Mary's face, you know, it makes me want to cry. Hmm. She's clutching her heart and her other hand is sort of like coming out towards him a little bit. Maybe sad, but also almost a look of expectation. Like I knew this was going to happen. Yep. Here we yeah. are. This was it. This was, this I was, I was, was told gonna, that this I was going to have to, my heart was going to be pierced by a sword or whatever, yeah. you know, like. Yeah, she has a serenity and sort of a, she's the only figure close to the cross that has like a determination about her 
John looks distraught. Right. Mary Magdalene looks distraught. Right. Um, She's accepted it. Yeah. At, there's a little bit of peace. Like I. Yeah. Well, and and he, she's the only one that he doesn't have to forgive. Um, yeah. You know, Mary Magdalene is sad and heartbroken, but she's also begging for mercy. Right. Hmm. Well, another interesting facial expression is on the massive Roman soldier with his hmm. armor and his big red cape. He's looking up, and the look on his face is like, "Oh, I don't think we should have been involved in this." Right. He's very tough, but also he. Yeah. I mean, he looks. Little, he looks regretful. Right. He does. Yeah. No, I, I think it's it's a fantastic image, and, and just seeing like everybody trailing off into the distance, and how they almost kind of fade, yeah. both in the detail. You know, they kind of just kind of fade into the distance. And we see the open tomb that's ready hmm. and and waiting, and the two figures draped in white. At the same time, they look skeletal and angelic you know they almost don't look like humans sitting huh. right by the tomb there right. almost like a where's waldo scene y- yeah it is, it is it's, I mean, it's very you, crowded and and he hasn't he hasn't overlooked the expression of anybody i mean even the the figures you know as far as we can see he's given them a unique personality and a, a unique disposition uh mm. in the scene you know i'm taking a big leap here but the way he has used the stone walls in this painting, particularly the ones behind the priests, they trail off into the distance like forever. Hmm. And you can guess a couple of things perhaps he meant. One is to suggest that as the stone wall trails off forever, the effect of this moment is going to have a forever effect Mm -hmm. on the world. Also, you could take a wild guess and wonder if also those stone walls which go on forever would embrace us all together as humanity after this moment has Mm -hmm. passed and he may not have meant that but you know as much as he's tried to give us maybe a realistic depiction he's thrown in a lot of symbolic elements like charles said you know anything that leads you off into the distance onto the horizon you can read so much into that it's a common artistic device and then the empty tomb and the sumptuous drapery and you know this sort of barren white area where only the people that love jesus the most have gotten close to the cross everybody's sort of staying back behind the stone wall it's incredibly detailed i I don't want to put this down at all only having seen his other work does it seem like (laughs) doesn't quite compare but there's there's a lot of differences in well this is this is a catholic art show kyle (laughs) so i I had to pick something biblical (laughs) well it's it's very cool and i I would love to see the other 364 if this is uh, yes well go to the brooklyn museum and make an appointment and maybe they'll let you okay Okay? and you know you've got to think you told me I didn't read that the Brooklyn Museum had them all. And in, in my job, I love to get a bigger batch of something. They, they got them all. Yeah. It's unbelievable. <laughs> that had to be one of the smartest decisions some curator made to say, to so, you know, he, his rep isn't as high as Degas, but I'm taking 365 of those. I think, oh, m- nice move. And all religious. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All mm-hmm. Very cool. All right, well, people should check it out. Again, it's What Our Lord Saw from the Cross, James Tissot, T-I-S-S-O-T. And uh, check it out. Find Waldo in it and you win a prize. (laughs) (laughs) You'll never get a prize if you're looking for Waldo. (laughs) So what is going on at the museum these days? Well, uh, we actually have an exhibition of Salvador Dali and Ooh. another Catholic who had a late in life reversion to his Catholic faith. We've and talked about him in the past. Yeah, we have. And, and what we have on view are his illustrations for Dante's Divine Comedy and then Le Chant de Maldoror, which was another French piece of literature, which I'd, I'd have to look up. But really two sets of different illustrations, one pretty wild before his reversion, and then, of course, the Divine Comedy, which well, a lot and, of us will know that story. And the first one really is about this character, Maladoro, and he's an evil guy. Hmm. I mean, every the writer put in his character every bad thing you can do, and that's what this guy stands for. And Dali is at a wilder time of, of his life, and he hasn't, you know, grasped the faith again. So he was the perfect pick. 
the, the book was not a very good seller when they first published it. When they decided to republish it, you pick an, a, a hot artist like Dali to do the illustrations because it'll sell more of the books. Oh, sure, yeah. And it did. So here's Dali at his peak of his wildness and misbehaviors doing all these scenes for this guy who's decidedly evil and intentionally in the eyes of the of the writer. Huh. And then there's a big flip-flop and Dali comes back to the church and comes back to the faith and Dante's piece is all about hell, purgatory, and paradise, heaven. Mm-hmm. And well, that's sweet by comparison. All right. Well, I'll have to check it out. I'm excited about it. Thank you so much for sharing with us again. People can check out fwmoa.org or fwmoa on social media That's for right. more information. Stop by the museum. Check it out. Thanks. Thanks We'd love Kyle. to see you. Thank you. If you'd like to support this show and other great audio programming, go to redeemerradio.com and click donate. And until next time, remember to leave room for the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit.